Hi, everyone. Welcome to the June Making Mitigation Work webinar. Thank you for joining us today. And if you would, uh, please put in the chat your name and where you're joining us from today. Welcome, wherever you are joining from. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, everyone. It is so great to see people joining from coast to coast and from countries around the world. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, my name is Lori Peek, for those of you whom I haven't met, and I serve as the director of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the monthly Making Mitigation Work webinar series, which is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible with the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. Thank you for joining this webinar session, which will feature four esteemed mitigation champions who are making an enormous difference in terms of advancing risk reduction as well as equitable disaster recovery efforts. Thank you so much to all of our participants for being here and for the work that you are doing to reduce the harm and suffering from disasters. A few announcements before we begin the formal webinar session today. This forum is being recorded. The captioned video recording and presentation slides from today's webinar will be posted online at the Natural Hazard Center website, which is hazards.colorado.edu. This is also where you can find the recordings and supplemental materials from the prior Making Mitigation Work webinars. Uh, this is actually our 19th that we have hosted over the past two years, so please check out those past webinars as well as access the many other free resources that are available for download for your uh, work. Thanks to a partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, we can offer one contact hour of emergency management training through the IAEM certification program. To receive credit though, you are required to be here for the entire webinar session today, but as always, I know you're gonna wanna stay. Please visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the Trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. And you can contact Katie Murphy at haztr at colorado.edu for more information on receiving your certificate for attending this webinar today. And Katie's going to put that email and the link to the trainings uh, credits in the chat box. If at any point during the uh, session today, which is going to be very conversational and interactive, if you have questions or comments, you can offer those either via the chat box or the Q&A box on Zoom. The panelists as well as I will be doing our best to monitor that chat and Q&A. But if we don't get to all of your questions or comments today, we will make sure and ask the panelists for written responses to the questions directed to them and we'll post them on our website. So now we are going to turn to the topic of today's webinar, which focuses on the role of mitigation champions in helping to make mitigation work. I wanna share a little bit of context on this concept of mitigation champions and why it is so important to us to feature these four extraordinary speakers today. 
several years ago, I was actually working with a team of engineers and social scientists and seismologists on a big global earth risk reduction project. And as part of that research, we actually visited 11 of the most earthquake prone cities in seven different countries around the world. We did surveys and interviews with uh, uh, hundreds of stakeholders across these different uh, sites that were at, at an incredible risk to earthquakes. We interviewed public and private sector leaders, leaders from schools and hospitals and other vital social institutions. And one of our most consistent findings across all of those places that we visited, which included low income as well as high income countries, was that people in these different and incredibly diverse places, they were aware of the risks that they faced and in many cases, the rising risks that they faced. Um, and they also faced a number of barriers in doing something about that risk. But when we ask questions in our interviews about what had propelled forward movement in these places, we consistently heard stories of what we came to call mitigation champions. These are the people who turn their concerns about current and future hazards risk into advocacy and practical action. It is impossible to overstate what an enormous role these mitigation champions played in turning the mitigation tide in these different places. That is why I am so honored at this moment to turn now to our four mitigation champions who are doing so much to reduce risk in the places where they live and work and also to promote equitable recovery policy. So today you are going to meet and hear from Tom Hughes, who is a state hazard mitigation officer with the Pennsylvania uh, Emergency Management Agency. David Pravat, who is an associate professor of civil and coastal engineering at the University of Florida. Shannon Van Zandt, who is professor and department head of landscape architecture and urban planning at Texas A&M University. And Annie Best, who is planning department manager at Meshek and Associates uh, in Oklahoma. And so I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen right now so we can see all of our panelists and engage in more of a conversation today rather than a um, formal set of presentations. And so what we're gonna do first, just to start off the webinar, I've asked all of the panelists if they please just take two or three minutes to introduce themselves to all of you who are out there and who have joined us today. And in particular, to tell us about their work with hazards mitigation and maybe why they think they're on a panel that's focusing on mitigation champions. And so without further ado, Tom Hughes, I'm gonna start out with you. Hi, uh, Tom Hughes, I'm a state hazard mitigation officer with the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, mitigation is the center of the universe. Uh, and we have been the uh, Schmo since 2009. Uh, in 2009, I got hit with a snowstorm and then had to play catch up with uh, three um, a hurricane, tropical storm, and superstorm Sandy. Had about 120 projects that um, kind of hit us real hard and got through that. And I can say they're all closed now. But I uh, have worked with uh, various FEMA funding streams. Uh, some of these may bring back some memories of the legislative free disaster mitigation grant, the severe repetitive loss, repetitive flood claims. Uh, pre-disaster mitigation, which has now moved into BRIC, and some of those have gone in now into the flood mitigation assistance uh, program. So I have both FMA and BRIC, as I call it, in under my shop. I also have all the planning for the 67 counties. Uh, we have uh, state the state system of higher ed has 14 disaster resistant university plans, uh, and then uh, I have about 65 non-disaster and 30 disaster mitigation projects right, running right now. And currently, with uh, being the co-chair for a state long-term recovery task force for the COVID-19 response uh, and recovery efforts. So uh, currently I'm the co-chair uh, for the Pennsylvania Silver Jackets team and the vice president of the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association. That's a little bit about me. And Tom, we're not even gonna ask what you do in your spare time because it's clear there's <laughs> none of it. So thank you for joining us. Next, we're gonna turn to Shannon Van Zandt. 
Hello, everybody, or howdy, as we say here at Texas A&M. Um, I am at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. And, you know, Texas is uh, feels like the center of the disaster world, <laughs> especially as we move into June and the hurricane season. Um, of course, we regularly have hurricanes. Um, we also had a major winter storm this year that actually killed more people than Hurricane Harvey did, which is um, not a kind of record I wanted to break, um, but also a very unexpected uh, record to, to break at that time of year. Uh, I am an urban planner by training, and I am in a department of landscape architecture and urban planning, which is also the home of the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center um, that has been around for almost 30 years at this point. And we have a long history of applied research. Um, that's one of the things I love about being an urban planning researcher is that we are interested in creating knowledge, but we're mostly interested in how to apply that knowledge to making communities safer and more resilient. A lot of my work focuses on disadvantaged populations and particularly the intersection between affordable housing and, and recovery and, and preparation for disasters. And of course, here in Texas, we have a lot of people living in the floodplain, a lot of people living in the surge zone, um, and they are affected almost every year by flooding of some sort. And so I'm very interested in the land development that leads to those types of outcomes. Uh, I like to say low income people live in low quality homes in low lying areas. And while that may be an oversimplification, it it's helps us remember that relationship between social vulnerability, physical vulnerability and exposure or risk. Um, I think, uh, Lori invited me uh, because of a lot of my advocacy work through Texas Housers, also known as Texas Low Income Housing Information Service, which advocates for housing solutions for low income Texans. And I've been involved with them for uh, about eight years now, um, particularly looking at rapid recovery from Hurricanes Ike and Dolly, which occur both occurred in 2008. Um, however, state funding for them really didn't start flowing until about 2014. And so I was involved with them in developing a rapid rehousing pilot program and evaluating it. And we have tried to take our learning from that process to the state legislature um, to finally get some legislation in place that helps communities plan. Shannon, thank you so much. And I am definitely going to be following up on that um, very soon. So thank you. And next, we're going to turn to David Pravat, who may want to contest whether Texas is the center of the disaster universe or Florida. And so David, over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, David Pravat, uh, an associate professor and, and uh, wind engineer. Um, I'm an island boy. And that pretty much drives why I'm interested in, in natural disasters and in particular hurricanes, because on an island, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. Um, and for me, for that experience of uh, uh, knowing that your planning, your, your, your safety is not going to be uh, predisposed on a piece of plywood that you put on a window, but it starts long, long, long beforehand. Um, I got involved in uh, wind engineering simply <laughs> with the, the naivety of a grad student. I thought, wow, we had Hurricane Gilman in uh, um, Jamaica. We had, uh, you know, Montserrat got Hugo in 1987. Three years, I could solve this problem. I thought it was an engineering problem. I thought I could uh, just tell people, you know, put vertical rebar in the walls and, and tie your house down and so on. They would listen to me. Ha! They didn't. Um, I have been back to the Caribbean for Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, the US Virgin Islands, Hurricane Matthew 2016 in, in the Tuberon Peninsula in Haiti. They really didn't listen to me. Um, and therefore I realized I had to work with other people. I actually had to speak to other people. I actually had to listen to people who might be affected by um, 
natural disasters. That's very humbling for an engineer. We think we can solve everything. And so the, the approach now is to, to understand that it is not an engineering problem. Engineers and other professionals are merely one part of a whole community. If a community wishes to survive into the future, they will come together. If they don't, they will not survive. And that's me. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, David, and welcome. And last but not least, Annie, would you please introduce yourself? Um, of course, thank you, Laurie, so much for the invitation. And I'm really honored to be serving with these incredible other panelists. I recognize many names on the attendee list. So hello, hello. Um, and I would be remiss before I introduce myself if I don't also mention that uh, Janet Meshek, who is the founder and owner of Meshek and Associates, is on the uh, webinar today. So very excited about that. Um, my name is Annie Vest. I have been in this profession for 11 years now, which means I'm starting to consider myself like old, which is crazy. Um, but I'm incredibly passionate about uh, hazard mitigation as a whole after getting my start 11 years ago at the Nebraska Department of Emergency Management uh, prior to moving to Oklahoma. Um, since moving to Oklahoma, I've spent time, half of my career working as the state hazard mitigation officer, and the other half as a planning consultant, um, getting my start in the planning world working for uh, Ron Flanagan, who is a longtime consultant for the city of Tulsa, and then now landing happily at Meshek and Associates, taking over the contract for the city of Tulsa's hazard mitigation plan, their community rating system, their mitigation programs, and um, it's just been an incredible ride over the last 11. So um, a little bit about me aside from what I do in my day-to-day, -day, aside from working at an engineering firm, I uh, consider myself to be an advocate in this field on an equitable implementation of policy that can be applied across the nation. And so I also serve on the board of directors for the National Hazard, Natural Hazard Mitigation Association with Tom Hughes. And um, that organization, we really have gotten our um, legs beneath us the, the last 12 months or so, working a lot with uh, various entities, including the Natural Hazard Center, FEMA headquarters, and others, to try to make mitigation accessible and equitable across the board. Um, currently, I serve as the planning department manager at MESHEC, and we service a variety of entities ranging from the city of Tulsa to the Muscogee Nation to very, very small rural communities like the teeny tiny town of Tallahassee, Oklahoma, which is approximately 100 people as of the last census. So I'm just excited to be here today and I'm excited to get engaged in this conversation. Thank you, Annie. And I hope uh, on behalf of the whole panel, we can say to Janet Meshek how uh, fortunate uh, we think she is to have you there. And so thank you for joining us here. Uh, Andy, I'm gonna keep you up on the, the line if you don't mind. Um, the next set of questions that we wanted to ask the panelists based on some of the questions we've been getting through this webinar series over the last several months are really related to mitigation success stories. Where, uh, where has mitigation actually worked and where have we had some breakthroughs? Um, and when has serving as a champion really worked? And so Annie, Annie Tulsa in particular is oftentimes upheld as a mitigation success story. And so I wondered, would you talk to us about, um, about the work there, the longstanding role of mitigation champions in that context or in another context where you've worked, but what has, uh, what has worked and why? I'm sure, and it's such a big question talking about Tulsa. Um, I'm humbled to even be in that space, and I feel very fortunate to get to work with them in this kind of newer era of hazard mitigation. Um, but before I dive deep, just for anybody on the call that might not be familiar with Tulsa, um, we're located in northeast Oklahoma. Uh, the Arkansas River splits the most southern part of our city, and we're also um, just covered in a spider web of 36 various creeks. And so we're impacted a lot of different ways by flooding. And um, over a series of decades and decades of disastrous floods that occurred in the 70s and 80s um, through truly uh, a 
a social network of incredible human beings from Ron Flanagan to Ann Patton, uh, we can say to ourselves today that we've been successful and we've maintained that success. And I think the, the thing that's really important um, to understand about Tulsa, and I can't dive deep into the weeds of what happened then versus where we are now. Um, I certainly have heard the stories. I've certainly worked with the individuals, but the, the one thing that stands out that I think has translated over the years and over the decades is just the social fabric and the importance of the relationships and the true whole community and interdisciplinary approach to mitigation. Uh, Tulsa's never, Tulsa has never been siloed in its approach to mitigation. Um, we've been a, a collaboration of various entities ranging from the local citizen engagement that demanded change way back 30 years ago to continued citizen involvement to the establishment of our stormwater drainage and hazard mitigation advisory board that still maintains advisory roles over the stormwater program in Tulsa and additional built relationships with other nonprofit partners, such as Tulsa Partners, which is now the Disaster Resilience Network, that have really been side by side with the city and have built that success and just embedded it into the fabric that is Tulsa. Uh, we have great relationships with our elected officials, with our state partners, with our federal government, and everybody plays an incredibly important role in moving Tulsa's program forward. Um, I know this webinar is going to be recorded, so I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it really lightly and it's not like super publicly announced, but FEMA knows, but um, we've been working with Tulsa as a CRS community. Uh, they were, I think, the first class two over 20 years ago, and a few things have to happen, but it looks like they're finally going to go to a class one community rating system community. And that's a testament not to, um, you know, the things that we're currently doing now that could have all of a sudden just started, but it's a citizen group that had a concern with flooding, that made sure that their voice was heard, that was the local advocate and embedded themselves into the community and built that over the last several decades. So we're really excited. Um, Tulsa is an incredible opportunity because of the uh, political condition that they are. We have a great mayor, we have a great council, we have uh, great leadership in our stormwater department. And that seems to just transition over time. But what is nice now that I think uh, at some point somebody should really tell the story of the different political climate changes that we've been able to successfully walk through and things have still remained pretty constant and that's the people that are behind the scenes pushing that. So Tulsa's success is certainly uh, continued through policy and advocacy and most importantly, the people that are on the ground behind the scenes pushing that work every single day and will be in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Annie, a quick follow up then David, I'm going to turn to you next. I know one of the questions that comes up a lot in these webinars is often sort of the perception that residents of communities, they're actually pushing against <laughs> regulation and don't want it. And I think what we just heard in your story is the vital role that residents played in wanting mitigation, wanting flood protection. And so was that sort of, was there kind of one loud leader? Was it a group of residents working together? Can you tell us a little more about those ordinary citizens who have made an extraordinary difference there? Sure. And, you know, if you, I hear the tales from, I benefit from having a relationship with Ann Patton and have been able to ask these questions to those that were there. And it's almost like storytelling for me at this point. And I, I just love to listen. Um, and, and it really was just people storming City Hall back after a series of really catastrophic floods in Tulsa. And um, we had water, I think they flooded, some homes flooded like three times in the same year. And it's not just small amounts of flooding. And they felt at the time that Tulsa wasn't enforcing the National Flood Insurance Program requirements. That was right. This is the 70s, right? So it's still new. Um, and I think over time, that group was able just to make the change. And I've, I read one report that um, Professor Ward-Lyles from KU interviewed many recently. And we 
it mentioned about um, some of the things that happened with some of the federal funding maybe that we got back then maybe happened because somebody baked a pie for one of the Corps of Engineers employees. <laughs> it just just having those relationships and those partnerships, but those citizens, we could not have done it without them then. And it's a lesson truly now I use that. Um, I do a lot of work. Uh, in fact, I'm still doing a lot of work unpaid volunteer just because it's the right thing to do from the state of Oklahoma's most recent flood. And I tell the citizens in these neighborhoods, they have to be their own voice. They have to push the elected officials. We can't do it for them. It has to come from them. And if they demand change, the change will come. Thank you, Annie. So David, you uh, obviously straddle sort of two multiple worlds, but two big worlds I'm going to focus on now with your academic research career, and then also being a professional engineer. And so will you talk to us in terms of success, what you would label successes and major paradigm shifts that you have witnessed on the research side and also in terms of the, the professional side with your association with the American Society of Civil Engineers, for example, where have you seen breakthroughs and bright spots? Well, the, you know, for me, the, the bright spot is that um, in 2022, ASCE wind design uh, code will finally include a tornado resilient design code. Okay, um, th this is, you know, it sounds small, people think a uh, code is just a small thing, but uh, let's take us back to history. When did this start? Why was this push ever conceived? It started in 1970. So it's a, it's a great, great win to have this code, but it's quite a tragic tragedy as for me as a professional engineer that it took us uh, you know, 50 years, uh, essentially 52 years to get a building code for something that damages and kills people every single year. Okay. Uh, the, the success story though was, um, it started with the tragedies, the dual tragedies in, in April 27, 2011, and then May 20th, 2011. For those unfamiliar, that is a Tuscaloosa, followed by essentially the Joplin tornadoes in which 258 people lost their lives. Um, and a group of engineers, myself, uh, uh, John van der Lint, um, many, many engineers came together as well as from the private sector uh, to look immediately at the forensic damage um, but more importantly, it was to lend our voices and our professional reputations to say this is an intolerable situation. All right. Um, uh, at the time, and it's, it's, it's inconceivable to think no, but as engineers, we sort of felt our, our work professionally was only on the, 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 the corporate or municipally owned property. That is the large bridges, the utilities, the roadways, the transport, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that the individually owned houses, residential structures, well, that's the center of um, private practice. People bought those things. This is not residential infrastructure. However, we wanted to show that uh, wherever the roads go, the utilities go, the, uh, you know, whatever infrastructure you have, it all leads to the sidewalk in front of a house. Okay, that's a fundamental purpose for every other piece of infrastructure that binds us together. It is a residential infrastructure. And therefore, if we wish our societies to stay and to grow and to flourish for not just your lifetime but others in the future we have to consider uh, the safeguard in that residential infrastructure and so just that thought of getting engineers to admit hmm we are going to now think of houses collectively communities uh, collectively as part and parcel of the things that we're concerned about um, you have seen the, the initiative, the incentives for, for folks to change. Um, 
the, the, the major part of that was this, that we had to actually study the damage caused to houses in ways that engineers have always studied the damage to commercial structures. In other words, we just had to apply some of the same principles that we've applied to the tallest high rise buildings or largest bridges to these uh, very, you know, modest structures and do the same things, provide safety and welfare for the people living in that community. Thank you, David, and thank you for all the ways you're always expanding that scope of vision and we're going to follow up on some of the other areas that you are uh, leading leading forth shortly. So thank you for that. And I'm actually going to turn to Shannon now. Um, you mentioned at the beginning in your brief intro about your work with Texas Housers and some of the policy advocacy work that you have engaged in, in addition to your expertise in research on housing recovery. And so will you tell us about one of the places where you've been a champion as of late, as you actually recently testified to the Texas uh, legislature on um, equitable long-term housing. And so will you talk to us about that experience preparing the testimony? Did you feel like it did it make a difference? And um, yeah, so let's start there. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Texas's legislature meets every two years. Uh, and so you've got to take your opportunities when they come, you know, and we started uh, harassing the Texas legislature uh, right after, like, I think that 2015 was the first legislative session that I testified at. And, and um, a lot of this happened because of Texas housers. I was invited. They, they're very good at kind of helping write the policy, finding a champion for that policy in the legislature, um, and then inviting you know, experts, and I, I probably shouldn't use air quotes, but experts um, to come testify about the different issues. And so whenever I'm given a chance, I will talk about inequities in disaster preparedness, mitigation, recovery. I will talk about it all day long. Um, and, and so just being given the opportunity to speak about it, they brought me in and just wanted me to talk about what we had seen in Hurricane Ike. Uh, because after Hurricane Ike, I had a, a three-year longitudinal study looking at community recovery on Galveston Island. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, there was another uh, hurricane earlier that season, Hurricane Dolly, which hit the lower Rio Grande Valley. And the, the lower Rio Grande Valley, right at the tip of the United States, the border with Mexico, is among, if not the poorest part of the United States. The levels of poverty there are equivalent, if not exceeding um, Appalachia and other very poor areas in the country. The, the three counties at the tip, Willacy, Cameron, and Hidalgo counties, have um, poverty levels upwards of 40%, and they're also upwards of 80, 85% Hispanic. Um, many of them are non-English speaking, many of them are undocumented. So in, in terms of vulnerability, they are the, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And um, Hurricane Dolly was um, a non-event as far as a lot of people were concerned, but it dropped about 17 inches of rain in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And so <clears throat> being able to go to the legislature and, and talk about what we had seen in Galveston and then talk about what was also happening in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And, and this was six years after the hurricane um, where, where people were still living in, in shelters or without proper homes. Um, and there were lots of issues related to getting FEMA uh, assistance because they were getting a lot of, of uh, what's the word? Um, you know, the, the homes were already damaged. And so it was, they weren't getting settlements or they weren't getting payments because the damage pre-existed the storm, or at least they couldn't determine whether it did or not. Because talking about low quality homes, these are in some cases in the Texas Colonias, which are substandard communities outside of city limits, typically that may not have infrastructure at all, including paved roads, much less um, stormwater management. And if they do have stormwater management, it's ditches that run out into the fields behind the homes. Um, you know, the quality of homes is very low. And so um, give, being given a chance to talk about that in front of the, the legislature, it did feel like nothing was happening because 
the bill didn't go anywhere. <laughs> the bill didn't go anywhere through the first legislative session. Two years later, we came back with a, you know, a, a slightly enhanced bill and it didn't get anywhere either. And so it wasn't until after Hurricane Harvey hit in 2017 that the legislature was ready to listen. And, and, and they did listen. They, were, they passed a lot of, of hurricane bills that year. Um, a lot of them related to being able to do better research, which was great. But, but importantly to me, they passed the bill that we were trying to get passed, which allows communities to do pre-plans, pre, pre-disaster recovery planning, particularly related to housing. And that to me is a big win um, because my, as a planner, my, a lot of my advocacy is around planning ahead of time because you're simply not going to be able to take advantage of the money that is flowing into the community if you're not, if you don't know what you want to do with it. And we definitely have cities in Texas and I'm sure in other places that, that when they're receiving their CDBGDR funds, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what, what they can use it for and, wh- and whether that's actually gonna help the people that need help. And some of the understanding from our legislature, legislators around that issue were really surprising to me, um, particularly related to low-income home ownership and rentership. Um, one of my areas of interest is in what happens to renters. Houston, for example, is 50% renters. And, and of course, most of our federal and state policy is oriented towards owner-occupied housing. And so there's a big gap there. There's a big gap for um, you know n- rental of uh, renting homes as well as as rental housing. You know multifamily kinds of rental housing. And, and so being able to work with the communities, which is where we are now, um, being able to work with communities to develop pre-disaster housing recovery plans, I feel like is a big step forward. And um, we spent the last year kind of developing some indicators and a guidebook for how to do that kind of planning. We're working very closely with the general land office um, to be able to get that out to communities and to help communities who are taking advantage of of doing that to to be a, a to be eligible for more funding. I think Texas is doing, the GLO in particular is doing a really good job at trying to get the money to the communities that need to do planning um, with the hope that that planning will lead to better outcomes. And that's definitely something that, that I'm looking forward to, not just as a researcher, but also as an advocate to see that the work that we're doing and the work that we're helping communities do actually has an impact and saves lives and saves property loss and, and it helps people recover more quickly. And Shannon, thanks for bringing in that crucial, the tenacity of a mitigation champion and not giving up because sometimes it is until that, that time is right, as you just said. And so thank you for that. And uh, Tom Hughes, I'm going to turn to you now on this theme of successes and actually have sort of two channels. I'd like to follow uh, both that have been recent topics of these webinars. So I wondered if you could talk to us both about buyouts and about nature-based solutions, because in those hundreds of projects you talked to us about in your introduction, I know that some of them have focused on buyouts and you also have some recent partnerships around nature-based solutions. So could you take a couple of minutes and and talk to us about those two threads? Sure, sure. I, I did want to take a step back, though, too, though, that I think, for, you know, for the other SMOs that are on here, for the other mitigation officers, uh, and for those, uh, you know, the stakeholders, um, you know, looking at risk reduction and equitable uh, disaster recovery as a SMO, you know, the state, locals, tribes, and territories are um, working with communities that may not meet, that are impoverished communities, that are small and impoverished, maybe, you know, and they may not be on the FEMA list. I just did a check today. We have a PA uh, 47, uh, Act 47, Distressed Municipalities, that we have our own dis- uh, our own definition that you know they they not only have the shock from a disaster but they've already had the stressors from just you know daily operations just you know it's just where they where they are and so you know that's one of the issues that we have to deal with so, you know you deal with high turnover rate as a schmo and as a mitigation officer a lot of those are high risk type communities to work with uh, they don't have the, the the capacity the capabilities to actually do that. But again, they're the ones that are stuck in that bad behavior. They're like in a do loop. They, they, they can't get out of it. And as a, as a champion, we need to break that cycle for them. And we need to actually 
help them. You know, and I, I think, you know, in our state, we've done a pretty good job of, you know, if we've got to do the application, we got to do the application. We got to stand in front. We got to take the heat rounds. Uh, you know, we need to talk to the politicians. We need to talk to our federal partners and we need to make sure that, you know, we take care of those communities. If we have to run a benefit cost analysis, figure out a way how to, how to get there. The other thing is that I run into, you know, being a, it's a voluntary program is also we need to deal with cost share. Uh, not many, you know, with that, I was getting that with the impoverished communities, it's a 90-10 split for FEMA. But if I can't get them on that list, then I got to find out usually 25% or sometimes with other programs, you know, if it's not FEMA, 50% of that cost share. And how do we do that? So I just had, you know, the, there's some storytelling here that went on and I, I like to hear stories and like to tell a story. City of Harrisburg, um, when I, as a schmo, we were looking at a sinkhole issue. 53 units or within four um, row homes were sitting over top of the sinkhole and we couldn't get any traction on it and nor could the fire department because they sent a fire truck on, on a fire call through one of the, the, the roads out in front of this, this, uh, this row house, a row home, um, trying to figure out how could we relocate uh, those individuals, looking at a whole community and how could we do it, relocate them to where, try to keep them within the city of Harrisburg, how could we do that, but also then fit within the other other uh, constraints of uh, you know, requirements that, that FEMA might have. And oh, by the way, we had some community development block uh, uh, funds, disaster recovery funds that we're thinking, okay, maybe we could figure out that cost share and how do we do that? And so FEMA didn't have a policy for sinkhole at that time uh, and use of PDM was not an option. And I basically had to say, look folks, you know, uh, you know with our region three and, and headquarters saying, I'm gonna to have to stand up in front of the sinkhole summit that was called by the mayor to say, we don't have a sinkhole policy. And so, you know, right the night before um, that, that summit, legislators had talked to FEMA and they came out with a policy. It was like a two paragraph thing, I read it. And so we were good to go for, for the PDM. So um, we then worked with our Department of Community Economic Development to see that there's a 25% cost share with, with PDM for the locals. And we figured out a way using the community development block grant funding for uh, about 25 homes. And we still had the, the, the rest of the homes to figure out. So, you know, our, our partners at DCD said, look, we'll, we'll pick up the other round two for you guys too. We'll help you guys take care of that, that issue you have. Well, then the next hurdle was environmental and historic preservation. Environmental, we had to get an engineering report. So this is a, one of the things that, you know, we had the event in 2011 and so they actually, actually, from an engineering standpoint, had to look at, it wasn't this event, it wasn't this event, it wasn't that event. So it had to be these two events that led to that, that, that sinkhole. You know, they're sitting over limestone, so they figured it out. And oh, can, can FEMA take HUD's environmental you know, sign off? And sure enough, FEMA was able to do that as well. So um, I'm glad, you know, the, the federal folks are coming together where they're accepting the, uh, the environmental reports from, from each other. And, and that really is good uh, help to the states and to, and to the locals. Um, you know, as far as uh, the uh, URA, you know, taking care of the renters. We had a lot of renters. We also had uh, tenants said, okay, where do they move to? Here in a city that, you know, they, they had to find homes equivalent with square footage. How do you do that? How do you try to keep those folks sense of place together if they want to move in an area together? So. We actually, um, our DCD, Department of Community Economic Development, got a contractor uh, to actually help support that. And oh, by the way, URA is different uh, in FEMA than it is for um, under the HUD requirements. So, you know, we have, we can pay up to 7,200. There was uh, three payments that had to happen using the HUD money. Uh, and we were able to work through that through the, through the contractor. So you can see, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, as a champion, you got to try to figure out the different funding streams. You have to have the, the, I think the will of the legislature and the will of the locals to stand in front with you. And we actually went to, went to where they, where they live. We actually had our meetings at a church. And I tell you that worked out great. I mean, sure we had some yelling, but probably not as much as they would have you know, somewhere else, but um, it, we had really good productive meetings uh, and Again, you know, for the engineering report, we had the county use their CDBG DR money to pay for that. So a lot of entities, a lot of, a lot of stars aligned on that project. And I'm so happy that happened. And we then also had a lot of times you don't celebrate. So it's a park now. We brought everybody back, the residents, you know, anybody involved with the, the project did an overflight uh, and, and, and celebrated, you know, what, what I would call a, a victory. 
And so, you know, we don't do that enough in, in, in mitigation. Uh, as far as uh, nature-based solutions, I had an, uh, uh, just on this uh, brick round and, and a flood mitigation assistance round, I had uh, a uh, American Rivers approach me. And they say, not usually do you have somebody say, hey, I have money. You know, I want to help you. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, uh, let me hear that again. Can you put that in writing? So they wrote up a little narrative. They sent it to me. And uh, I had already locked up my brick and my FMA. Um, and I'm like, I don't know where I can put this on the boat. So I figured out that, you know, they wanted to, you know, I wanted to see what they wanted to do. And I knew there was a county that there were some things they wanted to do looking at nature-based solutions. So I brought Lycoming County, very progressive county, has uh, uh, six different watersheds, bigger than the state of Rhode Island. Uh, they are looking at nature-based solutions. And so I looked at the flood mitigation assistance planning. And I said, look, there's a cost share with that. American Rivers, would you willing, be willing to work with this county to figure out how we could replicate um, putting in, you know, doing the discovery, doing the work to, uh, to put together a nature-based solution. And so, you know, that that really worked well. I'm hoping, you know, hopefully FEMA thought so, and we'll get that um, that uh, flood mitigation assistance uh, planning uh, plan grant planning grant approved, so we we can replicate that because um, we're also looking at other uh, nature-based solutions through the, the high hazard potential dam. Uh, there, there's some things that different funding streams that are out there that we really need to, to engage. Uh, and we've tried to do that. I got to tell you, my first nature-based solution uh, project was a legislative pre-disaster mitigation project. Oh boy. That was like, if you're going to be a schmo and take on a project, that was tough. But I think I, we learned a lot about, you know, the permitting, whether the core department of environmental protection, you know, the different timelines on what needs to, to sink. And that's what we're hoping to get to out of this uh, this planning process with Lake Homing County. How do we how do we make it easy for the locals? So, pretty much, Lori, that that's um, my two stories uh, um, on the question. Thank you, Tom, very much, and uh, as always, inspiring. And um, thanks for putting the puzzle together in so many different ways. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn now. Um, to a question I wanted to ask all of you about barriers. And so we know that mitigation champions face many barriers and challenges in their efforts to make lasting change. And we're already starting to hear some of this implicit in some of the things you've shared. So everything from staff turnover, rush timelines, complex application processes, indecipherable acronyms, cost share, <laughs> lack of support from elected officials, and the list goes on and on and on. And so I'd like to um, turn just a couple of minutes for each of you, if you would, because we have about 14 minutes left in the webinar. Um, but David, I'm going to start with you. Um, will you give us an example of a, a specific barrier that you have experienced, um, especially related, again, to sort of your academic demands with uh, in comparison to your ethical duties um, as a professional engineer, give us an example of a specific barrier you faced and how you've overcome that given the different institutional cultures in which you're working. Thank a you. Very good question. And it actually came up on online from Christine Hurley. She asked, uh, how do universities develop future practitioners with the passion to help? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we develop passion you know, we really have to be there for the passionate to come join us, right? That's why I'm here. And that's, uh, you know, my student, uh, former student, David Roosh at Auburn, uh, Peter Dayton at RMS and so on. These folks, they, they, I just had to get out of the way and they would run with it. Um, but to your point, Laurie, it, it's a toughie. I really, I mean, I am, literally 50-50 on academia and, and professional time, you know, so I have my feet firmly planted in those two places. And I was a structural engineer and a professional engineer first, whereby my responsibility was to, uh, you know, use the forces of nature for the use and benefit of all. That's it. That's ethically what we're supposed to do. Okay, we're now we transfer to academia, whereby uh, our our reward structure is a precondition on, on on we publish and we 
we get good money and we write things and you know we graduate people um i can do that quite easily without uh, you know any consideration for the welfare of the people so you know fundamentally it is a in it choice that i had to make and uh, to be honest i made it after tenure okay just just note that point i made it after tenure whereby i will not uh, i will not be uh, i will be true to myself okay that my research i choose uh, to help uh, low rise residential infrastructure because it is the most vulnerable and it is uh, the the one that most people lose the most proportionately it's a justice issue it's an equity issue okay um i could build a, a you know world trade center tall building in the same amount of time as, as it would take to fix uh you know the loss of 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 strength in in a, or mitigate an, a neighborhood it's that complex it's that problematic so that you know we have to uh, you know be the advocates to those funding agencies to say you know no it's i i know what you want you want in- innovation you want novelty but sometimes we don't need a new wheel to fix a problem that exists um too much of a, our our of a thrust for the new and the shiny uh, leaves too many vulnerable and weak populations in the dust. Um, and somebody needs to speak for them and they have to come from all, all us professionals to do that. Thank you, David, and thanks for being a, a light that people are drawn to. And so thank you for that. And Tom, I wonder you brought up the cost share um, issue and earlier, and I know that is something that that communities, especially low income low income communities, really grapple with. So, can you tell us the rest of the story on that in a specific time of um, where you uh, helped to overcome that that cost share barrier? Yeah, just uh, my my favorite two words are global match. <laughs> um, you know, trying to figure out the timeline on that, um, you know, we had our, I mentioned that we had our, lar- our largest disaster in uh, 2011 since uh, Agnes of 72. Um, we had a lot of folks uh, that low to moderate income and usually those tracks are within a special flood hazard area. And so we um, had the, uh, at the time, we usually, our state picks up for a disaster, the 25% um, local cost share. But for this one, it's so big. Um, the administration, the legislature, you know, they were looking at, okay, we're going to give 22%, 75% coming from the feds. They got to make up the other 3%. And so we were approached with global match, but we're like, okay, we're going to do an expedited process. So we were already down that road. So how in fairness, you know, do I, and, and I couldn't even do it anyway. In, in the FEMA platform, NEMAS, you had, there's a button there that you got to push, you know, before everything kicks out. And so we had already um, beyond the, the point of no return on that. So what we figured out a way though, talking to FEMA headquarters, talking to FEMA region, we actually uh, had our DCD, again, our Department of Community Economic Development, buy two projects. One on Hurricane Irene, one for Tropical Storm Lee, one had 23 homes in it, one had seven homes. And so we also looked at increased cost compliance for demolition uh, and also um, public assistance. But before you can use the public assistance dollars for the demolition piece, those that have insurance, you need to access that ICC. So a little more paperwork, we helped the locals do that. Uh, they find, signed over the IC, ICC to them. And so we're able to um, work through that. And at the end of the day, we uh, had uh, Plymouth, Ta- Plymouth Township uh, has about a third of their population and, and the businesses in the special flood hazard area were able to do what we needed to do. And also had communities that across, you know, in that disaster area that came up short, were able to use that cost share, that match, uh, be it a different way, uh, sort of a, a different, a, a back end kind of a global match to help out those communities that might need uh, funds towards that 3%. And it worked out really well. All of them are closed. I'm very happy. <laughs> oh, congratulations. And global match will be the two words we take away as well. So thank you for that. And Andy, I know we often, when we talk about barriers to mitigation, we talk about there not being 
enough funding. But I actually want to turn to you to talk about sort of the opposite end of the spectrum when there's an abundance of funding and especially what's happening right now with the abundance of federal dollars that are flowing, that's flowing into states right now. And so can you talk to us about sort of how you're thinking about that and, and working with communities to um, manage and to leverage and to uh, get some forward movement with that funding that's coming in? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to be super brief so that we can hear from Shannon and you can do closing comments, but um, you know, it's it been interesting watching from when I started in this, the DRF was frozen and uh, pre-disaster mitigation was always up in the air and if it was even coming through. And now we've just got so much money. And I'll go back to what Shannon was saying about planning is communities just aren't ready to receive this amount of money. We're not ready to receive it. We don't have projects identified. We don't know how to use it. And so my fear is we're losing, we're missing opportunities because we're not prepared. Uh, we've had hazard mitigation plans in place since the last two decades, right? Since DMA 2K and they've not been done well. I say that as somebody that writes mitigation plans, they're not plans, they're not good plans in most cases. I'm not saying every case, but as practitioners and as advocates on the ground, we've got to do a better job of making sure that we're planning for the risk and actually identifying meaningful solutions and um, I'll, I'll give one example in Oklahoma right now um, with the American Rescue Plan Act funding that's coming through. We have, uh, what, 39 federally recognized tribes in the state. Um, one of our tribes is receiving $421 million out of that fund. Another one is receiving over $900 million. And the expense, the, the, the amount of time we have to scope projects, implement projects, and uh, administer all of those funds, it's too short. We can't do it. Um, I had one tribe that looked at me and said, uh, with their hazard mitigation plan and said, uh, you know, the BRIC money, use that, FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, there's the acronym, right? Uh, use the BRIC money for things that the public don't care about because we don't need the money. We have all this other money that we can use for things like broadband. And then the third thing, as I'm rambling through this piece, aside from planning better so that we can use the fund, is also planning uh, um, I guess smarter planning with actual goals and vision on how do we not plan siloed, for example, the broadband conversation. If a tribe in our state is doing broadband, should they not consult with the local that's receiving the same amount of money for the same types of eligible things and make sure that we're making our money go wider across the board and doing more good with more of that money instead of siloing and doing segmented pieces of what we need to do to truly become resilient locally. So that was quick comments, but that's what I have to say, Lori. Oh, thank you, Annie. And you never ramble. That was crystal clear and so helpful. So thank you for that. And um, Shannon, last but not least, picking up on this theme of, um, I mean, what your whole career has really been dedicated <laughs> to. We know that all of those barriers we've listed off, they're oftentimes amplified in the, in the most marginalized communities. Right, right. And, so and what yeah. lessons do you have for us to take away from this as um, we're trying to find a path forward? Well, it just thrills me to hear Annie talk about the need for more and better planning because I mean, and I, sometimes I feel like I'm really pushing my own uh, discipline heavily, but I really do believe that we have we like like Annie says we have money that flows into our communities after disasters, and so for so long we have treated disasters as events that we can't anticipate, and that's. That's just wrong. We can anticipate, and particularly in states like ours, the ones that we represent, S disasters are not a matter of if, they really are a matter of when, and they're going to strike almost every community. And it's true that you can't necessarily predict when it will happen, but it's got to become part of your normal everyday planning. And we must see our comprehensive planning integrated with our emergency management planning. That to me is one of the biggest gaps that we we see right now is a fundamental disconnect between the professions of urban planning or disaster planning and, and mitigation and emergency management. We don't speak the same language. We don't even know that each other exists sometimes. So we have plans that are being made by our emergency managers that the city planners have no idea about. And in fact, may 
and often are in conflict with one another about where to develop, about how to develop. If we did them in a coordinated way, we would be much more efficient in our use of funds. And, and we, would, we might not even need a difference between CDBGDR and CDBG, CDBG because we could be building mitigation into our capital investment with the money that comes into our communities on a, on a regular basis. As a planner, and you can see I do get passionate about it, and hopefully I convey that to, I think I convey that to my students. You know, I want them to go out there and demand why aren't we planning for disasters? Why are we not doing a vulnerability assessment as part of our comprehensive plan? Why are we making a land use plan without looking at where our, our I mean, yes, we look at the floodplain, but we know very well at this point that the floodplain maps are not accurate and that they're not a guarantee of whether that's where the damage is gonna happen. In Hurricane Harvey, 40% of the flooding took place outside of the floodplain. So we know that we, we can't just look at the floodplain map and think that that's going to do it. It's not. And even if it did it, it would only do it for flooding and not all these other disasters that we routinely face. So we have to integrate the, our two disciplines. We have to integrate emergency management and urban planning so that the work that's being done at the community level is coordinated and, and addresses the, the, the vulnerabilities, the physical vulnerabilities, and of course, the social vulnerabilities. Um, in my assessment, we don't have real resilience until we are addressing the needs of the most vulnerable. It's like a chain, you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. If that link isn't there, then the chain doesn't do any good. And so we have to be looking at those areas that are most vulnerable, both physically and socially, which are often the same areas, by the way, um, but they have separate ways to address them. And we, we have to look at, you know, how we're, uh, we're, meeting the needs. And I think what happens that Annie mentioned is when we have a lot of money flowing around, we don't know what to do with it. It goes to the same people that it's always gone to. It goes to the people that have their hands up and say, like, we, we need this, we need this. And it's not the most vulnerable people because they're disenfranchised. They don't have a voice in local government. No matter, I mean, we've got to have them at the table making their demands telling us what they need, telling us how to help them and work that into a pre-disaster planning effort so that when the money comes, we know exactly what to do with it and it addresses our most vulnerable needs. Preach, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> So with that, we, we are right now at time and I am so sorry we are because this, I, I could listen to this panel all day long. And so to our remaining participants, I hope you will please take to the chat and offer your gratitude for today's panelists. And just in a quick few words of closing, just uh, Shannon and Annie, Tom and David, you are more than champions, you are heroes. And thank you for the work that you do on behalf of so many others. And thank you for being so passionate and for being leading lights in this space. Um, to those of us uh, out there who are looking to earn credit, just one last reminder, thanks for being here. Please reach out to us and Katie will help you to get your certificate for today. And last but not least, following on this extraordinary webinar in July, we will not be holding a webinar because we'll be hosting our 46th Annual Natural Hazards Workshop. We hope you can all join us virtually for this year's workshop. And then we hope you will be back with us again in August, where we're gonna feature three uh, researchers who are gonna talk to us about their recent work with mitigation messaging and planning research, picking up on the theme of the day. And so thank you so much, everyone. A special thanks to our special panelists today and to all of you out there. Uh, please, please, please take care of your Self and others, and we will see you in July and August, we hope. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.